thank, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to talk about the role of gas in the energy mix, focusing mainly on the UK, which I think is uh, primarily the interest for today. Um, in terms of my agenda, I'm going to focus on what is this role for gas in the energy mix? You know, well, what's, is it a transition fuel, a destination fuel? What, what, what's, its, what's its role in, in the energy mix going forward? I'm going to talk a little bit about government mixed messages um, because I'm getting the feeling that the government is sending out mixed messages about the role for gas. I'm going to talk a little bit about the energy bill and the electricity market reform arrangements which are key, fundamental to how gas will be used over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And, and as part of that, there's the gas generation strategy that government are looking for evidence for. And then give you a personal view of what I think is needed in terms of some clear direction and focus for um, the gas role. So what is the role? Um, and I think here uh, there's been a lot of debate um, as to whether gas is a transition fuel or a so-called bridge fuel, a bridge to a low carbon future where by 2040, 2050, we completely decarbonized or de you know, not using any fossil fuels at all, be it gas, coal, or whatever, it's all consigned, and we're in this future where all our energy sources in both the electricity sector, heat sector, and transport sector are carbon free in some way. Um, so is it a transition to that, or is it a destination fuel? Because people are talking about gas, particularly in terms of gas fire generation, if we can capture the carbon using carbon capture and storage um, uh, after, uh, after we've generated electricity, gas suddenly becomes a fuel that maybe is a destination fuel. The government seem to be slightly ambivalent about this, in my view. Sometimes gas is presented as this necessary evil that allows us to move to this uh, low carbon future. It feels it's an essential part for the next 10, 20 years because we need to fill the gap caused by the um, large combustion plant directive and retirement of some nuclear plants. We need to back up the new wind that's coming onto the system because wind is intermittent. So we need gas-fired generation to, to back up the system when the wind isn't blowing. And the problem we have with gas partly in the heat sector, which is a, another huge you know, third of our primary energy demand, roughly third, third, third of generation, electricity, heat and transport, how do we decarbonise the heat sector where gas, as you know, in this country is, is the primary energy fuel in our homes in terms of central heating? Will heat pumps or other low carbon alternatives work? But by 2030, 2040, this necessary evil of using gas for the next 20, 30 years, then uh, we can sign gas under the fossil fuels to history. Um, is that the future, or is gas with CCS, carbon capture and storage, um, make gas a destination fuel? So I think those are the, those are sort of the the debate that's going on at the moment. And I think if we look at gas as a transition fuel, some of the problems are that renewable generation technologies are still more expensive and need more likely to remain so for some time. And the support mechanism, even though it's starting to work in bringing forward renewable generation. Um, as you know, around Europe and even in the UK, governments tend to subsidise necessarily the introduction of those technologies uh, to get, get them going. And then sometimes there's a backtracking of those subsidies. They're reduced, happening in Spain at the moment, happened over here with the solar, uh, um, with the P, uh, PV feed-in tariff. You reduce the subsidies and then you cause an, an uncertainty in terms of the investment. A big problem we have is that will the gas fire generation necessary to fill these gaps over the next 10, 15 years be built? And a lot of investors and uh, energy companies are sitting on their hands at the moment, not making those decisions. They're waiting to see um, what incentives the government put in the new energy bill uh, to bring those forward. Because at the moment, if you look at the economics of gas fire generation, it's a, it's, a, it's a future of declining load factors. As more wind and renewable comes onto the system, the load factors of 60, 80% you need for a typical CCGT decline to 30% or lower. And um, you can't make money unless you have a suitable capacity mechanism, which is being talked about in, in terms of the energy bill. As I say, the heat sector is difficult. How do we replace gas in the heat sector? 
with renewables or low carbon sources um, at a reasonable cost. And I think we also have to have a question. One of the, one of the reasons I had to go to Moscow to talk to Gazprom uh, for the EU was to reassure them that Europe generally is interested in gas supplies from Russia because the messages coming out of Europe and the, EU, uh, and the um, UK to some extent is that by 2050 we have scenarios where we don't need any more gas, including Russian gas, which obviously makes the Russians a little bit nervous. Um, also, I think it's, I'll just to draw your attention to two papers published by DEC recently on their website, which I think is part of the sort of um, positioning of gas. Um, is it to blame for some of the problems that we're facing? And uh, household energy bills have obviously gone up a lot recently, uh, both gas and electricity. And there was a report published by the Committee on Climate Change, which I'll talk about. Then I'll also talk about a report published um, uh, written by Oxford Economics that looks at the impact of fossil fuel price shocks on GDP and uh, explain how they're being used. Um, essentially, the CCC report blamed gas for the increase in energy bills um, between 20, 2004 and 2010, where our household energy bills, electricity and gas, increased by 75%. And that was mainly due uh, to increases in wholesale gas prices. Only 7% of that increase uh, were due to the introduction of low carbon measures um, that the government were introducing to try and move us towards a low carbon um, policy. Another 7% were due to increases in transmission and distribution. But over 80% of the increase was unrelated to low carbon measures. And the CCC go on to claim that um, by 2020, there will only be about £110 of our £1,000 bills, which would be roughly the same as what they are now, um, will be necessary to support low carbon in generation. And um, they're basically saying 20% of our bills at that time will be down to low carbon measures. And this report obviously was part of a positioning to say, don't blame low carbon policy issues for our higher energy prices at the moment the increases over the last um, six or seven years have been due to um, increases in wholesale gas prices, not the introduction of low carbon measures. A slight critique of this I think is worth looking at is that it's absolutely right, our energy bills have increased by this, over this period due to the increased wholesale um, gas prices, but I think one needs to consider what the counterfactual might be, and what I mean by that is that if you, had a, if you hadn't had gas and we weren't reliant on fossil fuels over this period and we've been trying to uh, supply all our energy with renewable energy, it would have been a lot more expensive. And going forward, I think my, my real question, the question mark would be the CCC estimates of what low carbon measures will add to our energy bills in 2020 are very suspect and sensitive to deck projections of gas prices by that time. So it's... it's it's uh, uncertain, I think. Moving on to the other report about fossil fuel shocks, and this is quite interesting as well, because it's, it's basically arguing that if we use less fossil fuels, which now generally we're more dependent on, we're not self-sufficient, we're having to import more and more of our fossil fuels, oil and gas, it makes us sensitive to price shocks. So when there's volatility in uh, energy prices, that has an impact on the economy, and um, Oxford Economics did a, a macroeconomic study trying to quantify the um, impact on GDP of a, of a price shock in oil, of oil and gas. And they determined that um, there was an impact, and if we used less fossil fuels, we would have a lower impact on our GDP caused by these price shocks. Pretty obvious, I would have thought. Um, the, the critique, I think, would be that the numbers are very, um, very um, sensitive, I think, to assumptions. So if you look at these macroeconomic modelling, basically, um, by, the, by 2050, they're saying that if we went on as we were, not, not necessarily reducing our fossil fuel um, consumption significantly um, compared with the low carbon scenario where we have, the, the difference would be between 0.7% impact on GDP and 0.4%. I think, in my experience of macroeconomic modelling, that's a a very small difference and uh, it's difficult to draw 
strong conclusions from it. And I think it's also important just to point out that, obviously, this is a relative thing. Um, nobody wants these price shocks, um, but we are comparing our economy with other economies, other competitors. And um, unless everyone is in the same if everyone's in the same position, the, the relative impact on our competitiveness is, is, is much the same. But, but I think the important thing about these reports isn't so much the detail. I think it's just part of a, of a government uh, push to um, justify, in other ways, the move to a low-carbon economy, justify why we're doing it, um, and these reports fit into that um, agenda. Moving on to the energy bill and what the policy proposals are in the UK at the moment. We have the energy bill and the electricity market reform arrangements. Some good things in here regarding the new CCGT build. Um, they've been given grandfathering of emission performance standards out to 2045. So that means that they can be built now and still generate out to 2045 without having to install carbon capture and storage on the back of them, because 450 grams per kilowatt hour are their CO2 emissions. That's in line with an efficient CCGT now. That isn't a problem. The capacity mechanism that's being talked about um, is part of this understanding that we need to encourage these CCGTs to be built. How can they be built if the load factor, the price, the energy price they're getting in the market is declining because of uh, low load factors? Um, they need a capacity payment, and this capacity mechanism is being talked about as a way of not just bringing forward CCGTs, but also bringing forward other uh, technologies as well. Contracts of difference are a key part of this. Um, quite a complicated set of proposals. I think the industry is pretty divided about whether it's overcomplicated over or not, um, but th that's the mechanism that will be used to support uh, low carbon generation, including renewables, nuclear, and CCS. The gas generation strategy is another call for evidence by the government, and so they're, they're concerned about how they can get this generation built, gas fired generation built, um, and they, the, the aims to, are to set out in the autumn the role for gas in the electricity market, how to attract investment into generation, ensure security supply and uh, meet, as, as well as meeting our CO2 reduction uh, targets, but also make the best use of the nation's natural resources. And I'm sure Mike will talk about that later, making sure that we extract as much as we can from our uh, reserves in the North Sea. Just a picture to remind you about the current state of um, the UK gas market. That This is from quarter one this year. It's just, it's just a picture of showing where the gas is, gas is coming from in and out. So we've got a lot of LNG coming in at um, Milford Avon and Isle of Grain. Um, that's been the, the big shift over the last few years, uh, as well as our Norwegian supplies coming via Langeled and into, into St. Fergus. And then we've got our two um, uh, pipes from the continent, BBL, which is mainly import, and uh, UK, uh, IUK pipeline to Batten. So Bruges, which is um, mainly export, I suppose, on balance. And then we've also got the export to North, uh, to Ireland, North and South. So that, that's roughly the balance as where, where, where we are at the moment. In terms graphically, this shows over since 1998, up to, up to date, the, uh, the top line is the decline in um, indigenous production from the UKCS. Um, there's an import line that's growing um, recently. And of the bottom black line, that's the, L that's the LNG import. Um, so you can see that's really increased since 2008 uh, as a significant port part of our imports now. Um, just draw drawing your attention to, um, I don't think I've got a pointer, but there are two very faint lines, actually. I'm not sure if you can see them on this. The colours haven't come out too well. But there are two lines going along around the 400,000 gigawatt hour mark, which are the electricity generation, gas demand, gas going into electricity generation, and gas going into domestic, which is the darker line around the, just below the 4,000, uh, 400,000 line. There's a, there's a sharp decline of both of those over the last year. And that's important to note that gas demand this, this quarter, and generally annually, has been down 11% in the UK. It's a huge reduction. And that's typical of what's happened across Europe, caused by 
a number of factors. The recession, uh, lower industrial production, higher prices. One of that, of course, is that gas used in power generation in the UK is down 30% this quarter compared with the quarter before. And um, our coal consumption is up 20%. So in terms of emissions, that's partly as a result of low carbon ETS prices. Um, carbon prices aren't affecting the, the generation mix. Coal is cheaper than gas. More coal is running on the system. And um, we're producing more CO2 than perhaps planned. Renewables are up 39%, though, from a low base. But I think it's important to recognize that we're finally, I think, we're seeing significant um, build and commissioning of renewables. Um, whether we'll get to our targets is another matter by 2020, 2020 and beyond. But it's important to note that um, this quarter, 2012, with the, compared with the last quarter, off, onshore wind was at 50%, offshore wind was at 50%, hydro, and total renewables now installed are around 11 terawatt hours, up 39%. Um, and of course, as that proportion, as the renewable proportions increase, um, gas fire generation will be needed to back up some of this intermittent generation. But we are seeing, finally, some ex significant acceleration of renewable build. So moving on to a view of what I think is needed, and I think it's about um, the electricity market reform. We're at quite a nice time, I think, in the energy market. Lots of crucial things happening, and I think the energy bill and the EMR gives us a chance to make some changes and, and get a framework right. That framework needs to encourage new CCGT build. We, we need that, that generation. There isn't anything as economic or as reliable uh, as it, uh, as CCGT generation. Um, but there also needs to be some guarantee of a revenue stream out over the lifetime of the project to allow uh, investors to get some confidence. Um, I think the second bullet point is key to me as well, that the government and, and industry, I think, has a huge responsibility here to make, uh, to demonstrate the viability or not of carbon capture and storage on, well, I'm talking here about gas fire generation, but the same applies to coal. I think the industry has this responsibility. If we want gas to be a destination fuel, we have to be able to demonstrate that um, gas fire generation with carbon capture and storage works economically and technically. And that's, at the moment, it's a big question mark. In fact, all of the government's policies uh, about decarbonisation is, to some extent, dependent on making CCS work. We know it works in smaller scales. You know, all, we've demonstrated all parts of the chain that's at, at, at the lower uh, size level, but we need to now move up to the demonstration plant that the government is running a, um, a, 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 a process on. And beyond that, I think industry and government need to really bring this forward and make this work. It may, hopefully, we get the answer we want. I, it does work technically and economically. If it doesn't, we have a huge problem, not just for the gas industry, but for the whole decarbonisation uh, policy. How do we... Another question, Mark, is I think we need to really focus on how we decarbonise the heat sector, where currently gas in the UK is 80% is, um, of the fuel. And a lot of claims have been made about heat pumps. I'm, I think there's still a lot of question marks over that and whether it really works uh, economically sufficiently, uh, capital cost-wise, to, to work. And, of course, electrifying the heat sector isn't necessarily the best thing to do. I mean, so even if we can make electricity generation carbon-free, um, electrifying our homes in terms of the heat sector isn't the best solution. We need a much fatter grid in terms of wires, um, there are more losses. It's maybe not the best way of, of doing it. But uh, other solutions at the moment, like biogas, are talked about. But I think the percentages that they'll add to um, uh, this 80% is only going to be 5%, 10% perhaps of substituting natural gas with biogas. It's not going to be the answer, digesting all of our um, uh, waste. And I think we also need to put more emphasis on developing our long-term relationships, our relationships with gas suppliers around the world. And that includes, um, obviously, the Middle East, the Qataris, the Russians, and further afield. The, the world globally now is in a, is a nice position for gas. We have a very um, good supply-demand balance. We have, you know, we're awash with gas globally. 
the unconventional gas discoveries have really increased to double the reserves probably we have. Um, unproven yet, but there's no doubt that um, globally we are awash with gas. But we do need to make sure that our long-term relationships with suppliers around the world uh, are developed and we are encouraging them to consider relationships with us, delivering gas here, not just based on price, because I think that may be enough to satisfy some people, but I don't think it's necessarily um, the most secure future. So in summary, um, I think the position of gas in the energy mix is um, uncertain. We're at a very sort of interesting time. Government and policymakers are a little bit confused about whether gas is this necessary evil or the future. Uh, the energy bill and the uh, electricity market reform are a good pathway at this point for the energy industry. It's a good time to try and get some of these things sorted for the next 10, 15, 20 years. But we do need to recognise that we need a realistic but flexible energy strategy for the UK. One can only set out a framework so far, but one needs to be flexible to take account of technological change. Will CCS work? Will there other technologies maybe come along? We need to be reasonably flexible in order to take advantage of, of, of the ability to, to, to adjust the, the strategy. And that's where I'd like to end. Thank you very much.